It is Monday, August 14th, 2017. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And as usual, um, I don't have anything planned today. As a matter of fact, I'm still trying to recover from having read HR 3364. What a big mistake that was <laughs> but you know hindsight is 2020 right but i think it was important only because of course the last like any good you know a uh, murder film or or porn porn movie they always wait for the end to to get you to that money shot and so that's exactly what happened with regard to that legislation nestled buried deep in there i think it was like page 50 we finally ran into it there was something actually pertaining to cryptocurrencies and the regulation thereof. And so you may want to actually investigate that. Um, I am currently in the process of uploading it into, into my uh, YouTube channel now. Um, I did manage to get part two up. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and that is posted on my YouTube channel. You know, we did find out who the alien was. Uh, that we discovered in the first section, and of course that is Vitalik Buterin. Spoiler alert. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, the stuff that's that pertains most to us in crypto. I'm not trying to encourage you only to read the third part. I mean, because really, who likes, who doesn't like skip and live or just to have some cheesecake for dessert, right? But it is kind of important to to at least get an idea for the way that they form legislation and whatnot and what type of uh, what type of concerns they're supposedly addressing with this legislation. It gives you a lot of fodder if you ever want to do something important like, you know, write your congressmen or senators and tell them, no, please try and get this thing vetoed. It's the biggest piece of shit, most draconian piece of shit legislation you've ever signed your name to, and you need to get rid of it right now before you regulate us back into the dark ages. Because the rest of the planet is not going to be following suit with us on this one. That's all there is to it, folks. It is a fact. It is reality that when given the opportunity, they will make decisions for themselves and in their own best interest, without any regard for us or how it may affect our economy. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, throw down some some music to begin with. And uh, I, I'm I'm so immersed in Zero Days, you know that I I went to Slayer and I was really happy to see Slayer, but I almost wish it was Prong. I, I think that that Prong in the same kind of venue would put on a really good show. But anyway, I did see Slayer on on. Um, Friday night, and it was fantastic. It was more than worth the the time that I did spend away from you guys. And as terrible as that is to say, you got to understand, I've been listening to Slayer since I was 13 years old, and that was the first and only time I've ever seen them live. So, deal with it. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, throw in something from Zero Days. And I am really digging inner being. It, it kind of catches me like a, a little bit like death clock. But uh, yeah, I dig it. Anyway, here it is. Inner being, first dance here on Coin Metal. <clears throat> All right, and that was Poisonous Shadows by Megadeth. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a, a last-minute pick there. I'll tell you what, they always leave me just a little bit frazzled after uh, after jiu-jitsu. I did go today, and um, I got in a productive, productive day. I mean, we didn't really work on too many different techniques, only because the stuff that we were working was... It's pretty fucking complex shit. I mean, um, it was like it was both from from deep half guard. And, I mean, let me tell you something. You get that tied up on me on on a, on a half guard, you you should start worrying about me grabbing you by the legs and like and like flipping you to like hit you on your head. Because I mean, I I could I kept feeling like so many potentials for for me to pull it into a uh, into a situation where I 
I over rotated it to where instead of ending up with the um, ending up with me like up on their thigh that that I would be able to uh, grab both of their legs and just push into their thighs and and change the position. Now whether or not that would actually help me, I don't know, but I could feel it as as an option. And there there was another thing in there about like the the grip that the instructor was taking. It seemed like it was it was kind of inappropriate. I mean, when I say inappropriate, I mean like um, <clears throat> I felt like uh, if he had reversed his grip, it would have from what where he had it, it would have been a, a more natural movement. But uh, yeah, you know, I um, I didn't get hurt today, uh, but we didn't spar either. So, and I mean, I can still feel it in my forearm that that when I went and and uh, worked out the last time that even what little stress I did put on my form was was too much you know I I definitely need to kick back a little more let it heal a little more but it, it's kind of hard to do that I mean I've been dropping weight like a motherfucker I'm down to down to like 202 right now and when I started doing jiu-jitsu I was 231 so <laughs> you know it's been a uh, it's been a hell of a progression, you know. I mean, I kind of plateaued around like uh, between two thirteen and two eleven, and then I've been kind of plateaued between two o five and two o eight. And uh, just the last time I checked my weight, I was I was another three or four pounds lighter. It was two o two and a half. So, <sighs> but yeah, you know, I um I can't really rest. I mean, you know, it's like I'm either doing jujitsu or I'm working in the garden. You know, it's one of the two. And and either one is really strenuous, you know. I mean I had to uh I had to dig the flower pot for or flower bed for the latest iteration of Der Green Haas. And um previously it was I wanna see it was four foot by seven and a half feet and I had two plants in there. And it was entirely too cramped, you know. Um, fortunately, one of the plants turned out to be a male, and so uh, that opened up a lot of room for the one female in there. But this time around, I decided to get ahead of that because, like, I, I had this problem that the the first time that I, I built the framework, the two plants that I had were really, really dwarfed, and I did not water them enough. You know, some people think you just get the surface wet. That's that's good enough. No, 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 no. You gotta you gotta really pound it down there. Get that get that water to go down. Anyway, um, so I've been having issues with watering. You know, watering not enough, watering too often, watering not enough volume but too often, and all, all kinds of weird shit like that. And so I think this year I've got it right. My plants are looking so much greener and so much more full, and this time I'm giving them a lot of room. I, I've decided to expand their green hoss um, to 15 by 30 feet, and got four plants in there. It's perfectly legal under recreational law in Oregon, but in addition to that, I'm also a medical card holder, so. I'm I'm even within the legal bounds for that too. I, I as a matter of fact, I can legally have another two out there, but I don't like pushing shit. So, I mean, I, I would have had to make it another what, probably twelve feet longer to have another two plants out there. And, and in all honesty, that's that's as many plants as I feel comfortable having outdoors is for. And I think that's. It's a legitimate amount. I mean, I don't. I, I think with four plants that I can just cover, just cover my year's use, and that that's including making like hash and shit like that. But in any case, uh, you know, I learned a lot from from the previous couple times doing this. This is only my third year, but I'm doing some stuff that I would not have had to do. I mean, I would not have learned to do. If I didn't have previous fuck ups, like uh, last year, I the plants that I that I put in, they were um, they were seedlings from a friend, 
and like I was saying about the uh, the two plants that I had in there the previous year being being dwarfed, well, they they were short and they were really really tight, and so you know it it, it threw off my expectations for how to build how big to build the the uh, greenhouse, and in all honesty, for two seedlings, it should have been about fifteen feet long and about ten feet wide. And if not a little bit wider, um, because there's just I, I needed more room. I needed a lot more room, and I even dwarfed her. You know, I and and I bent the shit out of her too. I I let her grow to about oh, five feet tall, and I literally bent her over ninety degrees, and she grew another four feet out of that. So I mean, she would have been she would have been nine ten feet tall from from the ground to the tippy tip tip of her top bud she probably would have been about 10 feet tall but <clears throat> because of the adjustments i had to make for my uh the limitations on my greenhouse it was only like eight feet tall at the highest point i think it was like eight and a half nine feet tall and so uh you know, I I literally would have had about two feet of plant above my roof if I just let it grow straight up. But because I bent it around, I had to make adjustments to make sure that the plant got full exposure uh, to the sunlight, and that's to minimize minimize mold and whatnot, and maximize, of course, bud growth. And I happened to, by doing all of the adjustments that I did, I happened upon some interesting ways to bend the plant that inhibit the bullshit growth like you'll 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 find if you ever get into cannabis growing you'll find you end up with all this little bullshit growth on the inside you know just little little sprigs of stuff that don't don't become anything right well with this way that i was growing all of those little sprigs became colas became about five to seven inch long colas and so I kind of, I basically, I, I turned my plant into a big scrog, but not in the same way that, that you do indoors where you just have a big net and you suppress it and kind of interweave your, your plant in it. No, 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 no. This was a freestanding scrog, meaning I, I pulled the branches as open as I possibly could. And what I would do is I run a little line close to the stock that would support the the branch and then i would pull it down over the support and the the reason you do that is because you don't want to stress the joint where it attaches to the plant okay what you're trying to do is bend bend the the branch out as flat as you possibly can without breaking it you know without twisting it over because it, it will roll over if you if you pull it too far out it'll roll over on its side you don't want to do that but you want to keep it you want to keep it to where it's oriented straight up but as as straight as you can possibly get and the way you do it is you take a little little ring of uh, foam covered wire and you can find that shit at garden garden shops all over the place there's a spool of it and it's this wire with a with like foam around it and what i did was i would make little rings with it you know like just wrap it around my finger and twist it once <clears throat> and then i would untwist it and then put it around the branch where i wanted to pull it down at and, and you really got to pay attention to where you're pulling it down you don't want it to be riding it at, at a joint anywhere okay you want it to be on a blank blank section in between joints you know, so if you got a spot where you got leaves coming out, you don't want it to ride on that because it'll it'll just rub the leaves right off. Because you you want it to be able to flex a little bit with the wind, okay, but not too much. You, you're trying to retain a kind of a candelabra shape, you know. And so I figured out that by doing this, when it came down to my final yield, I was able to fit all nine feet of that fucking plant. In one of these little storage bins, and that was in a pound and a half of that was bud, and that's like including leaves and stems and stalks and branches all in a bin, and a pound and a half a pot. So I plan to kick that ass this year. I plan to 
do that, but even better this year. And so far, I've got a good start. I got my, I got, basically, if it were a three-phase project, I'm done with phase one and phase two. Phase one was making the flower bed and, and getting the plants into it. And that was, that was probably the toughest part. The second toughest part, I've got that done. And there is one tough part left, but it's not as tough as digging holes in hard pan, clay, dry clay shit. I mean, that, if I didn't have a hose with, that I could, that I could wet the ground with, I, pfft, man, I'd still be out there fucking digging. I'd still be out there digging. But, anyway, I terraformed a hill. That was phase part of phase one. Actually, if we wanted to go four phases, I've, I'm through f- three phases of it. The first phase was flattening the fucking ground, terraforming the footprint for the spot. The second phase, of course, would be making the flower bed and, and getting getting the soil back into it and all that other business. Phase three was setting up the ground framework that I would build the roof on and s- Phase four is actually building the framework for the roof and then skinning the project, meaning putting putting a skin on it. And uh, I've got some adjustments that I want to make from last year. It seemed like I didn't get enough airflow, and I mean I got good airflow, but I I didn't get enough. You know I needed I needed more airflow to go through there <clears throat> to kind of kind of circulate away some of the heat i had some heat issues um because the 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 environment was way too small and that was the other reason why i'm making this one so much bigger i mean i'm literally giving it an additional five well an additional three feet on either side because i'm going like the the bed itself was five feet wide and then i'm giving it five feet on either side of it and then five feet on either end and so it's uh it's a much bigger facility. I think I'll get a, a better yield and uh, better performance out of it. But anyway, this is not pot talk, nor is it jujitsu talk. This is coin metal. So let's get down to it. And, of course, like I said, I, I, I didn't have anything really sorted out here to, to talk about today. But I do have an article from CNBC, and it's always really entertaining when... Uh, when we do get articles from them because they they tend to uh there there's like a memetic or uh or like a like a vocabulary kind of thing where they they have a way of thinking about currencies and stocks and and business okay and it's all based upon uh, debt instruments you know, basically, that this this idea that they have, and it's it's based on that five five day work week, that that forty hour work week. You know, it's all it's all tied into this. It's almost like it's almost like if you're in that era, the original era, because I guess we're about to embark on this again, where you have people in the world that think it's flat, and then people in the world that know it's round, right? And you're the people that are are still thinking according to a a flat flat earth they're the ones writing the news now the rest of us know the world is round we see evidence of it all day long every day but these guys are still telling us it's flat well that that's what it's like now except like the vast majority of people still think the earl, the world is flat because they're living in a mimetic a mindset that it that actually applies to that you know where, where that was actually functional and we're no longer there we haven't been there for fuck at least a century since we started taking up the 24-hour um, work cycle where uh, where we instead of having just the eight-hour shift we had night shifts too you know and then we started breaking breaking that up into three shifts and so on and so forth. The point being that <clears throat> that mentality of of markets it contaminates the way that they talk about our markets. 
you know, because they they don't have a reference, they don't have a a a, a reality kind of reality based kind of thing that anchors their experience and gives them a way to talk, uh, gives them a, a way of understanding what we're doing here. A lot of them think that you know we're we're playing fucking Pokemon, which in essence we are, but on a global scale and a rate of about seven seven transactions per second depending on the currency you're using anyway here we are cnbc investment firm van eck calls bitcoin a fad then files for a bitcoin etf (laughs) that's kind of a strange market signal isn't it oh this is a fad fuck let's get in on it (laughs) <laughs> Evelyn Cheng wrote this apparently and um, I'm going by the name No Penis. Here we go. Money management firm Van Eck is both skeptical of Bitcoin and planning to sell a related investment product, illustrating a rising perception that the surge of interest in the digital currency creates a high risk opportunity that may be big, too big to miss. Last Thursday, Joe Foster, portfolio manager and strategist for Van X flagship International Investors Gold Fund, INIVX, said in a manager commentary a piece for, for July that Bitcoin will likely never replicate or replace gold's place as a safe haven asset due to fundamental differences between the two. And you know what? I think we found our subject matter for today. Bitcoin and other digital currencies are a fad that has attracted the attention of programmers, speculators, and early adopters, Foster said. It is my opinion that governments will not allow digital currencies to reach the critical mass needed to challenge the utility of fiat currencies, such as the dollar. (laughs) Bro, they're not going to have any choice in the matter. Quote, at best, digital currencies may eventually occupy some middle ground as a niche product, he said. At worst, they become a failed experiment that ends in tears. One day later, Van Eck filed with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission for a Van Eck Vectors Bitcoin Strategy Exchange Traded Fund that would initially invest in Bitcoin futures contracts and trade on the NASDAQ. Performance of the fund is determined by the price movement of the underlying digital asset, i.e. Bitcoin. The rate of change and the change in volatility, the filing said. Oh my goodness, we're definitely going to be reading that. The fund will be actively managed a va- actively managed ETF that seeks to quote provide total return without tracking the performance of a specific index. Derivatives like futures allow investors to bet on potential gains or losses in Bitcoin's price without buying the digital currency itself. <laughs> quote. Joe Foster makes a great case for gold relative to Bitcoin as a currency and store of value, Van Eck told CNBC in an emailed statement. Quote, Van Eck believes that the technology underlying digital assets, known as distributed ledger technology, has tremendous potential to revolutionize finance and trade. Digital assets are an investable asset class in their own right and continue to be integrated into the broader economy. The SEC declined to comment on the filing. Many digital currency enthusiasts have called Bitcoin, quote, digital gold and predict that a small percentage of gold's roughly $7.5 trillion market value will flow into Bitcoin sending the digital currency's price many multiples higher. Bitcoin has more than quadrupled this year, hitting a record high on Monday above $4,300, triple the price of an ounce of gold. Despite the many risks of the young digital currency world, analysts like Standpoint Research founder Ronnie Moes 
said cryptocurrency's rapid gains are not something he could keep his hands off of. Gold futures for December delivery hit a two-month high last week of $1,298.10 an ounce on rising worries about North Korean nucle- about the nu- North Korean nuclear threat. <laughs> yeah, whatever. The precious metal traded mildly lower on Monday, holding gains of 12% of for the year, but remaining within a year-long trading range. <clears throat> According to VanEck website, its International Investors Gold Fund became the first U.S. gold fund when it launched in 1968. The fund is up nearly 11% this year. The firm also manages the widely filed VanEck Vectors Gold Miners ETF, GDAX, or GDX, GDX, whatever. The portfolio manager Foster said portfolio manager Foster said in the 10th the August 10th blog post that it is clear that those who promote Bitcoin are using gold's image to help validate their product. He noted the differences between gold and Bitcoin such as how number 1 digital currencies are worthless without electricity. <laughs> Dude, let me put it to you this way, Mr. Foster. If you don't have electricity, whether or not you can exchange your Bitcoin will be the least of your fucking worries. Staying warm or staying cool will be a lot bigger concern. Staying fed, being able to cook food, these will be much bigger concerns than whether or not you can exchange your fucking Bitcoin without electricity. And let me tell you something, dude. Your fucking gold, it's going to be better used as a weapon than a unit of fucking monetary value in the event that there is no fucking electricity. Continuing on. Number two. Quote, Bitcoin mining is a difficult concept to fathom. What does solving complex math problems have to do with creating a store of wealth? Number three, distributed ledger passwords could be relatively easy bro- easily broken if quantum computing becomes a reality. You're f- so fucking far off the fucking deep end here. Foster did point out that distributed ledger technology or blockchain is quote game changing, but noted another cryptocurrency could threaten Bitcoin's dominance. Yes, it's called competition not an alien concept in our world. He said in conclusion, quote, For now, the only thing we can forecast with confidence in the digital currency space is more volatility. Yep, upward volatility primarily, dude. That high volatility and potential for significant gains may be enough reason for some investors to buy Bitcoin and related investment products. Other firms have proposed digital currency trading products in the last several months. The SEC said in late April it would review the Winklevi brother, Brothers application for a Bitcoin ETF after rejecting it in March due to lack of regulation for the digital currency. The initial rejection also noted the lack of, of a derivatives market for the proposed ETF which would have tra- would have traded on the Bantz B- BZX exchange. Since then, the Chicago, board's, the Chicago Board Options Exchange said in early August that it plans to offer Bitcoin futures as soon as the fourth quarter of 2017. The news followed the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission's late July approval for a digital currency trading platform, Ledger X, for clearing derivatives which plans to offer Bitcoin options in early fall. You know what? These derivatives are such a fucking waste of time. I mean, you know what? You know what derivatives were originally for? You know, with regard to like gold and whatnot, they were to, they were to offset lulls in supply. You got to be able to trade your gold, you know, even if you don't have it quite yet. And so you have the derivatives. It's like, well, you know, we're pretty confident that we're going to get a yield on the gold. 
and so we'll trade on the features of it. No, you know, I can see, <clears throat> I could see some, some like con game, you know, being able to do it because one one thing that I I immediately thought of with regard to this is that. You know, they're supposedly following the uh, performance of Bitcoin on the open market, right? So, what what mechanism are they using for that? And is there a way for them to game it? I mean, like, you know, they, uh, they maybe, um, I don't know, delay their purchases or delay their sales to, uh, you know, because in lieu of, of current market performance... In order to get a higher yield for themselves, and maybe not, uh, maybe not communicate that out to their customers. You know what? What's the advantage of using an ETF when, in fact, you can go on the open market and just buy Bitcoin? I mean, really, what? what you, you don't have any guarantee that they had the Bitcoin to to offset their, you know, their their supposed little collateral. I mean, and, and of course, there's also the risk of them doing a <laughs> a fractional reserve that they're permitted to do by the CFTC or FINRA or whatever fucking governing agency decides to take responsibility over governing that shit. That they will, you know, or again, we're fa- we face it here in, in our own exchanges where people run away with the fucking money. So there's no guarantee that the the of the liquidity of these funds you have to go by their tr- and trust you have to trust them i mean at least with the winkle buy they're the kind of guys that would probably present you with a cold storage wallet address and say look there it is you know 10,000 bitcoin or whatever the underlying asset is supposed to be you know that here it is here's proof of it i i would expect the Winkle by given their their level of involvement for as long as they've been involved, to consider that to be a functional bar for confidence in some sort of ETF fund. And in all honesty, I, I think that's all that should. should. That's all really that that should be needed. You know, regulations, uh, bureaucracies at the federal and state level, and completely unfucking necessary. Completely unnecessary. Anyway, we're going to jump into some more Van X shit because I feel like chewing these guys a new one. And, you know, it's just one of those things. I, I, I sm- Anytime I think about derivatives off of Bitcoin, it, given the fact that there are already altcoins, there are already ICOs, there are already a multitude of investment vehicles within cryptocurrencies that are that are more or less quote-unquote derivatives as the SEC has observed that we don't really need any more. And I think that the the biggest thing to, to take into account with regard to derivatives is what their actual function has been in current markets. If we take a look at gold, I can almost guarantee you it takes almost, if not more than the $1,300 that they're claiming is the price for gold. It takes more than that to harvest that ounce of gold in in actual material investment. I mean, may, maybe, maybe they're offsetting it with child slavery or something like that. I don't know. But the point being is I know how much I would want an hour for doing something like that. And... Gold should be like at two, three thousand dollars an ounce, with as much work as actually goes into dredging it out of the ground or rivers or whatever the fuck. The same thing with silver. The silver market has been gamed all to fuck, and it's all because of all this fucking paper silver floating around in the markets. It completely distorts the price of the physical metal. So now consider what that might do to the price of Bitcoin. That oh hey you know I don't have to I don't have to suffer the possibility of volatility by investing in Bitcoin itself. I can just buy a derivative. Give me a fucking break. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down some music. I want to go over some old school Megadeth. 
because these Van Eck people are kind of annoying me already. And so, yeah, old school Megadeth, killing is my business, and business is good, here on Coin Metal. And that was Slipknot. The blister exists. And it most certainly does, although I gotta tell you, it, it appalls me that these guys still completely misread the drivers behind the increase in Bitcoin's price. It's a couple things. You know, we got we finally got some sort of settlement with regard to um uh Segwit and exactly where that's going. <clears throat> Although it's not a, it's not really any more certain. It's just that we've we've gotten the impression that it's it's certain. And you know the fact of the matter is is it, it has yet to be fully played out. Yeah. Anyway, I I think that the um, the problem is is that people keep trying to give the impression that it's it's like completely settled. It's all going to go, and everybody they're, they're going to get their segregated witness, and and they're going to scale, and everything is going to be wonderful. Uh, however, th there isn't anything in crypto that is quote unquote gone according to plan and as a matter of fact I, I hope it always stays that way you know I mean I think that that some things have gone according to some people's plans where it's established though and like um, and how it actually affects the, the market as a whole that has yet to be seen you know, there's been all this bluster about, oh, we need segregated witness, oh, we need segregated witness, oh, we need segregated... And, and, and so we, we, I guess we have segregated witness now, and, and what? What, what wonderful thing happened? Did, did something happen? I, I, don't, I don't think anything really happened. I think we got, I think we got Bitcoin cash out of it. And if you, um, <clears throat> If you read around, you can find out there, there are other implementations that are out there running live right now. You know, so what what's really changed? You know, and that's that's the question to be asking yourself. And you know, there's been this big push to call uh, Bitcoin with uh, segregated witness Bitcoin. I, I don't think we can call it Bitcoin because it's not really Bitcoin. That it doesn't work like Bitcoin. It, it requires third parties in order to work properly and get the advantage out of it, i.e. Lightning Networks or Lightning Network Payment Channels or however the fuck you want to phrase it. And we don't need that in, in Bitcoin right now. <clears throat> I don't think we ever will. I, I think the push to try and make Bitcoin be like everybody's answer, I think is it's very inappropriate. And especially considering this. It's still within your cho it's within your choice, okay, to fucking hire a coder and say, look, dude, I want you to write me a coin. And it, I want you to make it to where, you know, transactions on this market get a dividend kicked into this fund and that fund will be dedicated to you know XYZ type projects and ops and your dev says okay writes the code you start up an IRC channel Twitter blah 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 you can still organically grow coins you don't need ICOs you don't need pump and dumps Although those are fun and, and to watch implode and watch people get wrecked on. It, you don't need them in order to have a successful product in, in cryptocurrencies. What you need to do though 
is you need to stand behind your coin and you need to support your users and you need to keep showing up you know when you drop the ball and when you start failing on your on your throughput and your follow through that that's what that those are the things that people pay will be paying attention to I shall I should say when it gets down to whether or not they can reliably transact their their monetary value on your network via your currency I mean it, it you can you can talk it up you can have the most wonderful website in the world you can actually have a customer service department and they could actually be responsive in the but you know what if you don't have <coughs> the the actual ability to fulfill on your promises on what your product is supposed to do uh, it's not going to be good enough for your thing to be a crypto project soon people are going to be start looking back on your on your track record and seeing what your coin is actually done you know and and that's one of the reasons why i i love verge i mean and this is not a show for them but i know that soonrock is dedicated to the project you know i'm i'm watching their their fucking telegram and in their you know they're active there's 3000 people in that tel- that telegram you know give me a fucking break i know a lot of them are lurking or or whatever but the point being that <clears throat> there's those people and then you go into the irc there's another 100 people in there i'm sure there's a little bit of overlap but I would say there's probably a unique uh, let's see there's 55 total in there uh, I would say that there's a, a total of maybe 3,500 unique users between the two no 30, 30, 33 yeah 3,300 unique users between both groups and I, there, I know there's a Discord group, and then there's a Slack group, and, I saw, and there's people all over the place watching and and participating in this coin. And so, I I'm not I I don't suffer that confidence, you know, or that lack of confidence. I don't give a fuck what the exchange rate is. Big fucking whoop de do means I get to buy more. But. <clears throat> for the time being it kind of sucks but you know what we ride the cycles man check the chart does that look like a fucking a straight line to you no I mean it, it looks like it goes through cycles when it's more valued and I, I believe in the longer term that the ability to transact anonymously is going to be much more highly valued than it currently is you know I I mean I hate saying that because it implies that at some point or another there'll be some sort of regulatory regime that would consider it to be um, an affront of some sort to be able to do that but I, I don't think we're at the end of it I think that we're probably the beginning and we're probably showing a really good example of how to accomplish anonymity in transactions. But I don't, I don't think that we're the end of it. I think when the time comes that that the utility for anonymous transactions is higher, that somebody will come forward with even better tech than we have. And it'll be up to us to, of course, either adapt or delete. But that's that's how it works in crypto. You know, and that's that's one of the things I love about it is that it's it's the most it most closely reflects nature. I mean, because that's how shit operates in nature. If there's a force in nature that's like noxious or you know kind of annoying to everybody, the the system around it reacts. You know, I mean, it's like a. <clears throat> give me an example like snakeheads it's a fish fish from japan 
it's ending up all over the fucking place because it's game fish over there. And so it's actually showed up here in the U.S. And the problem with snakeheads is that they don't have natural predators within 8,000 miles of them. But they're pretty adaptable about what they put in their mouth and what they're able to subsist on. So they end up consuming a lot of the forage base. The biggest problem with them is they can actually go from one body of water to another by crawling on the land and they can breathe air. That's not good. Anyway, <laughs> point being that uh, <clears throat> they they will get to a point where they are eating on themselves because they've already eaten everything else. They ate all the bass, they ate all the bluegill, the crappie, everything else. Okay. And they've gotten to a point where they'll be consuming themselves. Now, assuming by some miracle, something adapts to eating them. Now, this has happened with, with completely foreign and introduced uh, species that they hit a critical mass where they start becoming possible diet you know, menu items for other predators within an ecosystem. And this, as a matter of fact, you can watch a video of it um, on YouTube where the grouper out in the Florida Keys, they, they've had this stupid problem where some dumbasses have dumped lionfish. Lionfish on the, on the, uh, over the coral reefs. And like the snakeheads, they don't have any natural predators and they're poisonous and they got all this defense and shit. And so they hit this critical mass though, where they were displacing enough of the forage in, in their bellies and whatnot that they became a problem for somebody else. And that somebody else was a grouper. And if you, if you watch this video on YouTube, this uh, this grouper, he's like eyeballing it, and he's looking at it, and they're not very mobile. They're not very fast, and they're not used to having to be fast. They're used to like being like, all right, let me flare out the flare out the old hard rays here, and everybody else gets a, the idea that I'm I'm just like a aquatic porcupine with poison tips on me, and just leave me the fuck alone. Not this grouper. No, 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 no. He starts eyeballing it. And he's like, all right, if I approach it from this angle and chomp it really quick, I can probably disable a lot of those barbs. And that's exactly what he did, man. He bolted at it, hit it like a linebacker, chomped it real hard a couple times, a little, little soften up, spun it back out again, got an appropriate angle, and just <laughs> engulfed that bad boy. That's evolution for you. The lionfish hit a critical mass where they became, you know, a possible menu item for somebody else. And now I can almost guarantee you that grouper's progeny, they've got a taste for lionfish. And they're gonna they're gonna mouse some lionfish. And then they're not gonna be a problem anymore. They'll get chewed down to the volume of of biots that could be existing in the Florida Keys harmoniously with everybody else. I mean, it, it looks it looks painful while while the adaptation is happening, but it it didn't really take all that long. And I can I can only surmise that lionfish have a um, have a really high reproductive rate in the Florida Keys, probably due to water temperature or something like that. And, and that's why that they, they, you know, started their, their ascent in population. They hit a critical mass. Somebody else started getting encroached in by their demands on the ecology. And they got taken care of. And now they are part of somebody else's menu. But that's what nature does. And that's what happens in crypto. You know, I mention it a lot, but it, it, it's because of the the type of biological res type response it was and that's the um, <clears throat> the threat a, a long time ago there was a threat 
that ghash.io was was hitting 51% of the hash rate. And oh my god, they're going to they're going to make changes in the code that nobody likes and blah blah blah. You know what happened? If you look back what happened? ghash.io got most of its hashing power got delegated to other pools. And that process is it continued since the beginning of Bitcoin, and it will continue on after this. You know, these people that freak out about China and Jihan, Jihan Wu and all that, you're going to be like, Jihan who? Uh, two years from now, three years from now, you're going to be like, Jihan who? Because Jihan isn't going to be it. There's going to be an iteration of mining, there's going to be an iteration of electricity economy, economy or something something is going to change the advantage is going to go away in China and I, I've surmised that one possibility is this that you know you've got those guys out there mining right well eventually they're going to be wanting to spend some money out on the town right you know so they get their, their one out of eight days that they've been at that fucking mining farm off and they go hit it up and accidentally knock up this chick. Well, fuck. You can't ask that guy to, to live at the goddamn fab, you know, maybe 20, 20 30 miles away from her. No, she's going to move to town. And then she's going to have a kid and they're going to want a house. Fuck, houses require electricity. You know what? That, that's something that mining mining pools need too. Hmm. You know, if this happens often enough, we're going to develop significant competition for that electricity. Hmm. And all of a sudden, that's not free electricity anymore. Because they're having to compete with the small town that has erected around them from mining guys knocking up chicks and, and then the, the 7-Eleven that pops up and the McDonald's that pops up and the hospital that pops up to so on and so forth. All of these things will place additional, additional demands for electricity on these coal-fired coal fire plants. And of course, they're also making a transition over to, uh, to like... Uh, solar solar power and other renewables and that's that's a good move i wish we would do the same thing but the point being that this advantage that currently exists within mining it's not always going to exist the net the nature of bitcoin as it currently is is that we will adapt to this and, and you know i was talking to somebody else on twitter about this today about specialization within bitcoin and i think that Segwit LN, it'll introduce a whole bunch of specialization into Bitcoin that doesn't really need to exist. And it, some of it is into in response to this current disparity within the, the distribution of mining on planet Earth. Dude, don't give a fuck about it. If it's a problem for you, you know what you can do? You can go on to Amazon or you can go on to Newegg, or you can go on to any of these other sites, and you can acquire for yourself some fucking miners. And you can buy them. And then you can bring them home, and set them up, and dedicate some electricity, and some fucking bandwidth, and some patience. And you can displace China with, with regard to the advantage. You know, that. What people don't talk about with regard to this shit is that there used to be a lot more fucking miners. And you guys sit there and whine about it, but you turn around and look in your closet there, and you've got some fucking miners sitting in there, don't you? You have miners that you could have active right now that, yeah, sure, if you follow the current profitability, it doesn't look like you could make much money on it. However, if you were to have started mining, even with even with fucking deprecated hardware, I don't give a fuck. Deprecated hardware. If you started mining in January and you just left your shit running, okay, and you managed to acquire a Bitcoin or two, I guarantee you, you made a motherfucking profit. 
You made a motherfucking profit. If all you got out of it was one motherfucking Bitcoin, you did not spend enough electricity to offset the $3,000 in profit that you would currently be swimming in if all you did was hold the fucking thing. So, do not give me this bullshit about China dominates shit. No, it's you gave up. That's what fucking happened. You want to get back in the game? You want to fucking offset China's influence in this? Then get back in the fucking game. Don't adjust the fucking software so that it can be gamed and locked in by fucking banks and kick you the fuck out. No. No, 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 no. That is not the correct response. The correct response is get the fuck back in the game. If all you did was fire up miners, you would increase demand for the Bitcoin. You would raise the difficulty. You would increase the likelihood that one of these fucking mining farms would get deprecated and cost these people hundreds and thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, because they've got to fucking retool and re-get up to offset you. If that's all you did. But like I said, so imagine the curve now. You know, if you if you want to <laughs> if you want to talk about some shit, yeah, sure. We suffered some dips, but we are at all-time highs right now. And again, do not mistake this shit. It is not specifically and completely due to what's happening in cryptocurrencies. There is some increase in interest. There is increase in excitement. There's no doubt about that. There is kind of a bubble feel to it. However, what you have to consider is what's driving that interest in a bubble to begin with. It's an interest in profit. How much interest in profit are we talking about that we've gone up $3,000 in six months? And, um, of course, it was not a, it was not a straight path. <laughs> I'm 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 conceding to that. However, it's at all time highs now. So what's driving all this interest? And I can guarantee you, what's underlying a lot of it is Fed printing. It's lack of confidence in the 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 fucking magic wand waving of the Federal Reserve and the other central banks on this planet whipping up fucking money in debt out of out of nowhere and putting it on the fucking balance sheet and loaning it out you'll pay for it later you know it might might be 10 years from now might be 30 years from now but you'll pay it back despite the fact that they just waved a magic wand to create it and that's what's different about bitcoin and cryptocurrencies except for of course ICOs that have it written into the code that they can wave a fucking magic wand and create more tokens. Now, of course, the accounting is a little bit different, and you'll probably actually notice it if you're a holder. <clears throat> but you don't really notice it. It's not really as declared in in uh, Fed policy. You know, it's like we see the effects maybe six, maybe 12 months down the line, maybe even sooner. Of, of Fed policy, but that's that's one of the differences with cryptocurrencies is that you've got people eyeballing them 24-7. Okay, so if there is an announcement on the Fed, it's reflected in us. It's reflected in our markets because there's not a fucking, just an eight-hour business day going on here. It's 24-7. So we read it on fucking Bloomberg or Reuters or whatever, or from the Federal Reserve reporting it themselves, and we react to it. We we react in anticipation of it. And you know, I, I've harped on it a million times, I'll probably harp on it a million times more. But if you go back to Mount Cox, take a look at what the Fed was doing. They just announced QE forever. They've been pumping up to $180 billion into the economy every month for like, fuck, I don't even know how long it was. Uh, they did QE1, QE2, Operation Twist, QE3, and then they announced, you know what, we like this QE thing, we're just going to, you know, kind of 
kind of put a rock on the gas pedal and you know jump out of the driver's seat let let, let that drive the economy for a while <laughs> you know and, and here we are a couple of years later and it's still happening to some extent they've they've jiggered things around a little bit to to kind of tweak it around and what whatnot but despite increases in oil output and whatnot and the fact we're practically on par with Saudi Arabia right now <laughs> look at the gas prices they're they're going up that's how much fiat inflation is going on I, I used to categorize it as the AMPM index is I watch gas prices because that tells you a lot it doesn't tell you everything and they've found ways to jigger that around but they can only distort fiat inflation on the gas prices for so long they can get it to lag for two months they can get it lag for six months but they cannot get it to lag forever and when you start seeing that price in gas go up you you <laughs> you've got to understand that there is fiat inflation going on underneath that it's what's driving it there's dilution in the in the amount of actual federal reserve notes that are in circulation by the introdu introduction artificial introduction of massive amounts of it and that's why you're seeing it on gas prices now you've seen an increase in of course the dow it's at fucking all-time highs too that monetary value has to go somewhere and that's why it's coming into us I mean look at us man fuck we've gone from garage project to a hundred and sixty billion dollar market cap industry in less than a decade really think about it that's how much desperation is going on out there that even tiny teeny tiny us with our with our toy projects and our in our code and whatnot and the fact that Goldman Sachs can't seem to take their eyes off of us for some strange reason despite the fact that we're we're experimental <laughs> we, we've drawn the interest in the ire of the big boys and that's not going to go away but the thing you got to do is make sure that you don't go away because you've got to maintain our influence in the game and so I want to get further into this um, this uh, Van X shit and this is um, some gold and precious metal stuff uh, for Bitcoin and this is authored by of course Mr. Joe Frazier portfolio manager, manager and strategist let's drop down to reality for a moment or at least this guy's reality gold and precious metals gold sets a high bar for Bitcoin August 10th 2017 gold bullion rallies in July the monthly low for gold came on July 10th at $1204 per ounce gold then rallied to finish July at 1269.44 per ounce a gain of $27.89 that's a 2.25% uh, year to date gold bullion has gained 10.17 percent Woohoo! this was the third time this year that gold has successfully tested the twelve hundred dollar level although the US dollar had a precipitous fall in July it was not the primary driver for gold thus far in 2017 gold has been responding more to changes in real interest rates gold ha gold gold has an inverse correlation to real interest rates which move higher earlier in the month con coinciding with the gold lows before trending lower the change in direction for gold and interest rates was driven by somewhat dovish congressional testimony by Federal Reserve Chair, Chair Janet Yellen which the market interpreted as an indication that another Fed rate increase this year is less likely hmm. July gains impressive given uh, uh, July gains impressive 
given ETP redemptions. July saw heavy redemptions in gold in the gold bullion exchange trade of products. Gold fiscal demand from Asia is typically low during the summer and there were not any significant moves in futures positioning. Normally, this would contribute to price weakness, so July's modest gains for gold are somewhat impressive. It is possible that July's gold gains were driven by buying in the over-the-counter market. However, there is no published data for OTC transactions. We do expect that m more transparency for the OTC market will be available soon. The London Bullion Market Association LBMA and the London Precious Metals Clearing Limited LPM, LPMCL recently began releasing aggregate data on gold inventories in London vaults with a three-month lag. Vaulting statistics are a first step and are likely to be followed by trade reporting at a later date. Gold stocks moved slightly higher with the gold price. For July, the NYS, NYSE ARCA Gold, Gold Miners Index GDM NTR, gained 3.6%, while MMS, MVIS Global Junior Miners Index advanced 0.20%. Gold stocks advanced despite heavy redemptions in gold stock ETFs. A situation that parallels the curious July relationship between the rising gold price and the gold bullion ETP redemptions. Markets don't always do what is expected of them. <laughs> That's people cashing out of paper gold. Recent momentum suggests that $1,300 is likely to be tested. Oh no shit. While $1,200 has proven to be a resilient floor for gold, the price has yet to, to trend through the $1,300 per ounce level. Twice this year, gold turned down as it approached $1,300. The recent upward price trend suggests $1,300 may soon be tested for a third time. Gold prices typically t trend higher in the fall as seasonal t physical demand improves. In terms of identifying catalysts that might enable gold to break through $1,300, the most obvious candidate is economic weakness that might persuade the Fed to take a more cautious stance. The Fed is expected to announce plans in September <clears throat> to reduce its massive crisis era balance sheet, and there could also be significant risks surrounding these plans. Oh no shit. Gold is physical, Bitcoin is digital. Recently we have received many questions about digital currencies and in particular Bitcoin, defined as the world's first decentralized digital currency. The queries range from our general opinion to concerns that Bitcoin might displace gold demand. While we have no digital currency experts on our gold team, we follow the development of these new currencies with interest. It is clear that those who promote Bitcoin are using gold's image to help validate their product. Press articles often accompanied by a picture of stacks of shiny gold colored Bitcoins. Bitcoins are created by quote miners. This is aimed at creating the illusion of a solid currency. In reality, digital currency are strings of zeros and ones stored in a computer in some unknown location and cannot be touched or seen. Complete bullshit! There are, however, several important similarities between gold and Bitcoin. Both are outside of the mainstream financial establishment. Both are not issued or controlled by governments, and both are traded around the globe across borders. Supply of both gold and Bitcoin is limited, so they are sound forms of currency. For most transactions to be used in an economy, they must be converted into paper currency. Not all. Some can be spent entirely digitally, like Bitcoin. Gold versus Bitcoin. However, there are a range of significant differences. 
Number one, gold has been established as a store of wealth throughout human history. Gold's market capitalization is roughly $8 trillion, of which $3 trillion is in coin and bar form. Approximately $50 billion worth of gold trades each day. Bitcoin is microscopic in comparison with a market capitalization of approximately $45 billion and $1.5 billion in daily trading volume, and that is complete bullshit also. <laughs> Gold can be stored anywhere. If stored at home, it can be used for barter the next time a hacker or solar flare takes down the grid. Digital currencies are worthless without electricity. Delivering the taking delivery will always be impossible with digital currency, and that's complete bullshit. Also, I'm already f fuck you, man. I I'm holding my own digital currency in several different ways. So suck a dick. That's complete bullshit. Three Bitcoin mining is a difficult difficult concept to fathom. Not entirely, no. Bitcoin miners use computer programs to solve complex math problems and receive and exchange new bitcoins. What does this activity have to do with creating a store of wealth? Well, if you understood the process by which that actually occurs, you would probably understand why it is a store of wealth. 4. Most Bitcoin markets are lightly regulated and are located outside of the US. Yes. A major potential drawback to digital currency is their use for money, money laundering. Not really. Illicit trading. Eh, maybe. Computer ransom attacks. That's completely superfluous. They could be asking it from fucking Visa dollars. They could be asking fucking Chinese yen. Whatever. Tax avoidance, most certainly. And to subvert exchange controls. Absolutely. Expect governments to intervene heavily if any of these activities become significant. Too fucking bad. Over the past year, the People's Bank of China forced three biggest Bitcoin exchanges to adhere to anti-money laundering rules, despite the fact that most of the officials engage in money laundering themselves, implement trading fees, and then force them to halt Bitcoin withdrawals temporarily. I guess this is five or six. One, two, three, four, five. Distributed ledgers are promoted as unhackable. However, police were recently able to find the digital keys to an online criminal's accounts and seize approximately $8 million in digital currencies. <laughs> Whatever, dude. They... F Never mind. They didn't hack him. Okay. Let's go on. Six, digital currency has yet to stand the test of time. Nine years, dude. Nine years of time. Nine years of fucking 24-7 uptime. We do not know if a digital currency that is secure today will be secure under new technology. That's certain under any condition. Distributed ledger passwords could be relatively easily broken if quantum computing becomes a reality. Well, quantum computing already is a reality, dude, and it's not being used to fucking hack people's quantum key, I mean, uh, digital keys. Distributed ledger technology is game changing. The most significant development ha that has come out of the digital currency craze is validation of distributed ledger technology. This technology has the potential to revolutionize many aspects of the financial system, trade, and essentially anything where records are maintained. A secure system that eliminates middlemen has obvious advantages. Im imagine trading stocks without brokers, transfer agents, and custodians, a scenario where fees are likely to disappear. And yes, we've, al we've already managed that to some extent. Equally as significant, digital currencies have caused many to question what exactly a currency should should be and whether there is a better alternative to fiat currency. The monetary system is broken. Central banks seem powerless to prevent the economy from going through busts that destroy wealth and create hardship. Currency volatility under the fiat system has been extreme. 
politics, corruption, and mismanagement are a constant concern. Technology likely to improve gold ownership efficiency. Not really. <clears throat> uh, unlike many in cryptocurrencies, I have zero confidence in the idea of trying to maintain gold wealth via any kind of association with the cryptocurrency. There is no guarantee that the custodian of the gold itself will not overprescribe it, will not operate under fractional reserves, will not sell the gold out from under you and, and mimic the idea that they still retain ownership of it. The idea that it's stored in a vault somewhere is complete and utter bullshit. We've relied, we relied on, the, on, on that idea with, with Fort Knox. And look what fucking happened to that. They closed the gold window, then they made gold ownership illegal. I mean, give me a fucking break. Continuing on. Technology likely to improve gold ownership efficiency. Combining distributed ledger technology with an established sound and solid currency may provide the best alternative. To this end, later in 2007, the Royal Mint in the UK is set to launch Royal Mint Gold, RMG, will be, will be a digital record of ownership for gold stored at its vault while CME Group will operate the product's distributed ledger platform. It will carry the option to convert to physical gold. It is not clear whether this product will enable consumer purchase, purchases with some type of RMG credit card. Regardless, technology is accelerating towards the day when gold can be used both as a store of wealth as, and as an efficient medium of exchange. <sighs> Whatever. Digital currencies are not likely to replicate gold's unique role. There's only one unique role that they are not likely to, to fulfill, and that's as a physical medium of exchange. Now, it can be a physical medium of exchange, but I don't think that it will ever be an actual medium of exchange. Continuing on. Digital currencies are not likely to replicate gold's unique role. Bitcoin and other digital currencies are a fad that has attracted the attention of programmers, speculators, and early adopters. Given the fundamental characteristics of gold and digital currencies, we do not believe digital currencies will ever replicate or replace gold's unique role as a form, a form of portfolio insurance and as a hedge against tail risk. It is my opinion that governments will not allow digital currencies to reach the critical mass needed to challenge the utility of fiat currencies. At best, digital currencies may eventually occupy some middle ground as a niche product. At worst, they become a failed experiment that ends in tears. For now, the only thing that can that we can forecast with confidence is in, in the digital currency space is more volatility. And yeah, big fucking whoop de doo. We already know that. And that's the end of it. Thank goodness. Again, Van Eck is operating under a lot of assumptions that are not are not functional within cryptocurrencies. And maybe they should hire me as their their cryptocurrency expert because I, I they if they handed me this I would have sat there with a red pen and just said bullshit 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 bullshit. I mean it, it would look like a, like maybe a defense department budget on a, a from, from a FOIA request. It would be all like redacted and shit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all, all highlight marked and stuff. Be like, here, take it back and edit. <laughs> you know, I mean, because I, I wouldn't have released this report. This is kind of embarrassing, dude. I, I'm sorry, Joe. Uh, you, really, 
with the level of of actual investigation required to correct the assumptions made in this in this paper is minimal. It's minimal. I mean, if you got if you went to CoinDesk and you read any three articles, despite the level of bullshit that's that's in CoinDesk articles, you will get certain ideas across in your mind. Okay, the memetics of of how how our monetary paradigm is, is, differs from yours will become apparent to you. It's like a mind virus. After a while, you you will understand things like proof of work. Okay. It just takes a little bit of investigation. Just a teeny, just a teeny, 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 tiny, tiny amount of investigation on your part, dude. Just a little bit. I mean, re- seriously, Joe. If you read the fucking Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, just that alone would resolve like at least 50% of your conceptual difficulties here. At least. I mean, y- you would be able to make a lot of the hurdles that you're... you're you're having difficulty with here right now. Um, yeah. But enough about hacking on Joe. <clears throat> I mean, you, you got to forgive the man. You know, he's he's lived in a monetary paradigm for all of his life. And so it's kind of it's kind of easy to imagine how somebody would would have those conceptual blunders, you know, or disconnects. Not not really blunders. I mean, because the guy's making an honest effort to understand the thing. But I I don't know. I just I see that he's he's having some some cognitive dissonance with the whole thing. You know, and, and I I think that a lot of us do. I I'm sure that I do. You know, I I'm sure I have some strange fucking ideas that aren't real in my own mind about cryptocurrencies despite the fact that I've been involved at the level that I have for as long as I have you know I mean so again it's not it's not beyond me and especially considering how far I've come with regard to this shit it's not hard for me to imagine this guy's world you know and and where he may be locked down in it but I, I don't know. Like I said, I think that if he if he did just a little teeny tiny bit of investigation, he'd be able to get over the the hurdles. I mean, it sounds to me like the the only intel this guy's had on it has been from like his nephews or his son or something like that. You know, it's like and, and they're they're only peripherally involved. Like they've heard of it. You know, and they have friends that use it, but they themselves don't. But their friends have gone on for hours shitting in their ear about it, right? And they convey that information up to dad. And, and dad writes a report like this. That That's just my feeling on it. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down into some music. It's been a little while. And uh, <sighs> I want to play something on Zero, zero Days. And this kind of... Kind of uh, kind of explains my my feeling on it it's a compulsive feature projection this is off zero days here on coin metal and that was demanufacture by fear factory Whew. yeah anyway i think we were going to read this uh, van Eck thing gold bullion rallies blah blah blah, blah. 13 to be tested, gold physical, blah, blah, blah. No, you know, we already read this shit. And, yeah, I disagreed with it. <sighs> silly, silly people. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> oh, shit. This is uh, Van X, um, I guess this is their SEC filing. Uh, registration under the... Securities Act of 1933. Let's see how long this thing is. Uh, how many pages is it? Pages. Table of contents. Oh, Jesus Christ. 41 pages. Nah, I don't think we're... I don't think we're going to be... We're not going to be reading this thing today. <sighs> yeah. Anyway... I don't know. I I would endeavor into it, but 
dude, I just went through three days of reading legislation. It literally took me about eight hours to read that HR uh, HR thirty three sixty four, and I swear, dude, I I should have just went like Control F and and looked up the word cryptocurrency in the goddamn thing because it would have saved me a lot of fucking time. I mean, <clears throat> it wasn't until the, la- the last twenty pages that they even talked about cryptocurrencies in any significant length and I found that kind of disappointing really um, but I don't know maybe it's a good thing right that they didn't have more to say about us but I don't know I I think their impression of it was kind of kind of antiquated and I don't know I I'm trying to like forget about it really it's like I'm trying to like block it out of my memory it's like a, a horrible event that happened in my past I'm like trying to put it behind me and like carry on with life <laughs> it was almost as bad as reading bit license although that thing was was way fucking worse I mean really between California shit license and and bit license, I, I couldn't tell you which one I thought was worse, um, but they were both pretty bad. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I um, if you'd like to uh, if you'd like to listen to me read those, please feel free. Um, I actually got through both of those in in a single shot. You know, I didn't. It didn't require more than. Um, more than one show to address them. Although, I may be mistaken with Bit License. I think that might have actually been a two parter. But, uh, yeah, it, it was terrible legislation. Terrible, terrible, terrible legislation. And you see what effect it's actually had in New York. I mean, the, there there is some involvement in the cryptocurrency game there, but it's only like. It's only really, really rich fucking people that are able to do that because the, anybody else can't afford the fucking licensure. And there's also the issue of the fucking NYDFS dragging their fucking feet on on uh, qualifying people. So, you know, it, it, it's it's ca- it's having the intended effects, um, you know, that they intended, <laughs> but. Uh, only in New York, you know, it's like this idea that, you know, if it's not happening in New York, it's just not happening, (laughs) fuck you, (laughs) if it's not happening in New York, it's only because we can't afford the fucking, the, the federal and state bureaucracy that you guys decide to impose on anybody that challenges the status quo, well, hey man, that, you're, you're gonna turn Singapore into an even bigger fucking economic powerhouse than it currently is. There'll be teenagers there running their own cryptocurrency exchanges and and supporting fucking illicit cryptocurrency trade going all over the fucking planet. And their lack of regulation will welcome it. And they're not the only ones. Fucking Isle of Man, uh, probably Luxembourg and a few others that have, have basically flouted EU and and US law with with regard to regulating uh regulating their shit and it sounds like somebody has a fucking pop up this is why i hate these fucking people fuck you and your fucking media bitch i'm probably going to be reading a fucking article authored by you i don't need to listen to you fucking talk about it too and now i'm completely fucking mentally derailed god damn it Anywho, uh, let's let's get into this fucking article before this thing auto plays on, on us again. And this is on uh, CNBC. Uh, proof of our ever growing encroachment into the mind of the MSN or MSM, rather. Dennis Gartman shares why he is staying away from Bitcoin. Don't understand it. It's a Oh wait a minute! Wait, let's let's. Oh, this was published six hours ago by Elige, Angelica Levito. Um, clearly, no penis. 
Um, unless Angelica is like trans or something. Uh, fuck, I don't. I don't even pay attention to that shit. It's so. It's so not relevant to the whole conversation. It's like a somebody else. I, I read some article where they were thinking about black people and and or that their statements implied that black people were somehow um, less economically savvy. I I I was I was genuinely offended. I mean, because if I'd have read that article to to this one guy, I know he he would have been like, "What's this guy's name?" <laughs> where, where, where does he live? <laughs> yeah, we won't go there. Anyway, so th- yeah, this guy doesn't understand it. Continuing on. Bitcoin hit another record Monday, but commodities whiz Des Gartman still isn't buying. Quote, it's a puncher's dream, Gartman told CNBC's quote, Fast Money. I give them credit for that, but it is something that I will absolutely stay away from, have stayed away from it, didn't understand it to begin with, don't understand it now. Gartman said he appreciates Bitcoin's introduction of blockchain technology, however, the cryptocurrency's price fluctuates too much to convince him to invest. Dude, the coin goes up, the coin goes down. Buy the dip, sell the peak, ride the suck, get over it. Quote, what bothers me is that something that can move 5, 10, 15, 18% in the course of a day for what's supposed to be a pricing mechanism, Gartman said, quote, how can you buy a house? How can you buy a car? How can you buy Starbucks with Bitcoin when the price is going to fluctuate as dramatically as it has? I don't know, dude. Maybe you should ask Janet Yellen to stop printing fucking money. When Bitcoin was introduced, it was supposed to be better than common currencies like the dollar or euro because it was supposed to be finite. Gartman said, now it has become an infinite currency, he said, and that's a big problem. It has not become an infinite currency, asshole. Quote, we'll walk in one day and this will be, will all have ended, he said, and it will have ended very badly. Oh yeah, Mr. Gartman, the whole... All of the fucking Bitcoin miners on planet Earth are just going to suddenly fucking disappear. Give me a fucking break. This guy, these people drive me fucking nuts. What fucking century do you think you live in, man? It's not this one. Clearly. I mean, you, you, you probably own a cassette player in your fucking vehicle. I mean, I do, but it's only because I don't want computerized vehicle. That's it. I just don't want it. But this guy Gartman, uh, Jesus Christ. You know, the, the biggest problem for me is that I have relatives that listen to the, this guy like he actually knows what the fuck he's talking about. And I'd be willing to bet he has been the last to call anything correctly. I mean, maybe not the last, you know, like, Ben Bernanke is usually the last or while he was in tenure or or Alan Greenspan was pretty close to last if not absolutely the last um, but this guy Gartman his response to it is to stuff his own head up his ass I mean really dude you can't hide from this shit it's everywhere you're probably already using it Visa probably already has their own quote blockchain or distributed ledger technology that they're utilizing under the hood of your fucking credit card and you have no idea I mean it just it appalls me that these guys address things like this you know what it reminds me of it it reminds me of a CIA psyop going on at CNBC and like what's really going on here is that they're not they're not misreporting. Okay, what they're doing is they're trying to create the meme that we still live in 1985 and none of this is happening and this isn't going to impact your life and not in the mind of the MSM consumer. 
Okay, and so far they're very successful at it. Like I said, I have relatives that listen to, listen to this guy. Oh, Dennis Gartman says it's shit, so it's shit, man. I just it's a sham. It's a it's a fad. It's bullshit. And these are the same people that find out like after the fact, way after the fact, that they were wrong and you were right. You know, like, I I have a relative that I've been trying to convince to get into Bitcoin since it was about $200 a coin. Okay? Can you imagine how hard this person is going to be kicking themselves in the ass at 10 k per coin? And that's that's not some pie in the sky shit. Okay? Look at the fucking chart. That's destiny. You can etch it in stone. It's an eventuality. It's going to happen. The debts that will that will offset the current value of the U.S. dollar in proportion to Bitcoin to make Bitcoin go to ten thousand dollars of U.S. dollar value has already been issued. It's already been spent. It's an eventuality. I mean. That, that's just fact of the matter. And like I said, Dennis Gartman is living in this fantasy land where this isn't happening. The, the dot-com bubble was just an aberration. The, the housing bubble was just an aberration. There, you know, I'm sure that he was one of the last fucking people to be calling question, question marks on what was going on in 2008-2009. Gosh, I wonder, I wonder what's going on with these these ninja loans. No, that never even fucking crossed his mind. It's, the housing market is fantastic. Ben Bernanke says the fundamentals are sound, and so they're sound. You know, the building you're occupying right now is on fire, dude. You might want to grab an extinguisher. No, Ben Bernanke says the fundamentals are sound. You know, and then he woke up the next day and his fucking, his Lehman Brothers stocks were worse shit. And <laughs> Lehman goes bankrupt. <laughs> and this guy's left holding the fucking bags going, what happened to my 401k program? Bullshit. This guy knows what the fuck is up. He, he knows exactly what's going on. It's like, it's like listening to Peter Schiff talk about fucking cryptocurrencies. Give me a fucking break. Let me tell you something about Peter Schiff and why I think that his his stupidity concerning cryptocurrencies is just a fucking front. Okay, I, I and I'm gonna call him out right here. This guy, before the first time, and he's gonna be on the Joe Rogan Experience here pretty soon again, according to Joe Rogan. The first time that he was on the Joe Rogan experience, he told Joe Rogan, he talked to Joe Rogan about Bitcoin. And he was all excited about it. And, oh man, this is going to be... Yeah, all that enthusiasm went away. No, no, no. This is the mindset of somebody who's hodling. Okay? This is not somebody who's stupid. This is not somebody who's ignorant. This is somebody who is hodling. Long-term hodling. Okay? This guy's got a thick fucking crypto portfolio. I'm sure he's got plenty of fucking Ethereum and about, I don't know, five or ten other cryptocurrencies that he's heavily invested in. And and the same thing with Dennis Gartman. I, I'm sure he, he heard about this from his fucking nephew about four years ago. And he spends about three hours before he goes to bed checking his fucking crypto portfolio and tweaking it here and there. Meanwhile, every time he gets in front of a camera, he says, I don't understand that. I'm a fucking idiot. This is 1985. The fundamentals are sound. (laughs) Telling you, man. This guy's pulling the wool over your eyes. He's not this fucking stupid. You don't you don't get to stay on CNBC if you're this fucking stupid. I mean, these people were consistently wrong. What does that tell you? It tells you either A, 
they're hiring complete total fucking idiots, which is probably not likely because they're giving them six and seven figure incomes. Or they're disinformation agents set about to make you think, oh, everything is hunky dory, manufacturing is coming back, the US dollar is strong, blah, 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 blah. Everything is fine. The building is not on fire. The Titanic is not sinking. Everything is fine. That's what they are. Disinformation agents. You know, they're, they're laying all kinds of fucking f- facts on you here about the, the volatility of cryptocurrencies. Well, you know, if you've been reading these fuckers and just considering the price and the fact that they talk about volatility in every single one of their fucking scaremongering articles... But just regard the price and consider it over time. If you've been reading these scaremongering fucking articles on CNBC for the last year, and just regarding the price, you've watched it go up 20-fold over that time. Or maybe may, maybe not 20-fold, but not over the last year. But maybe four years, if you've been, or two years, or however long CNBC has actually been printing scaremongering articles, which I imagine is probably the last two to four years, and if you, all you did was regard the price, you would see that the quote-unquote volatility that they're talking about is a significant uptrend. And as I've communicated a million times, because it's not talked about here, and it's not even talked about in cryptocurrencies very much, is the fact that you're actually seeing a reflection of fiat inflation. Not exclusively demand, not exclusively excitement, not exclusively market dynamics within Bitcoin community and economy. No, 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 no. You're seeing a price offset due to fiat inflation, due to an, a vast increase in the amount of fiat currency being circulated in the global economy. And it, it just it pisses me off that these people won't report it that way. Because in in two years, people are going to be listening to this on YouTube, assuming, of course, YouTube still exists, and assuming, of course, they haven't deleted all my shit. Okay? Two years from now, people are going to be listening to this and going, why, why wasn't I listening to this guy two years ago? I, I'm, I'm absolutely serious, because the, the inflationary effect that I'm talking about, it's increasing. It's increasing in intensity. I mean, really, look at the Bitcoin chart. Look at it on the fucking year. Look at it on the two year. Okay? Uh, whatever. Look at it on, on the year chart. Okay? And you see that, that bull chart is shaped arc and then the ha 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 high end that, that we're at right now. You're, you're seeing a reflection of fiat inflation. That's, you can't explain that arc with an increase in miners. You can't explain that arc with grandma finally figuring out that she wants to buy Bitcoin. No, 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 no. No, there's just not that much. There's not that much of that type of interest in the economy. You can't explain it with VCs throwing money at it. I mean, so what? They've thrown it about what? Oh, maybe 40, maybe 50 maybe more billion dollars in VC capital at this. But that's nothing. That is nothing. They spend that in a month for oil exploration. I I shit you not. So, (laughs) you know, again, you cannot disregard this fact because what what it demonstrates to us is that there is no end in sight to it. Okay, like I said before, there's a lag between when they print it, when they utilize it, and then its effect out into the global economy. It has to be spent out into the global economy. Okay, and it's being spent on the fucking stock market. It's being spent in crypto, but it's also being spent in physical gold, physical silver. The stock market is just going through the fucking roof. And those aren't the only places. Real estate. You know, I, I've i told a friend today that there's a massive bubble in commercial real estate going on. And I, I expect that one to probably hit before 
the uh, residential bubble, which will soon follow. But these aren't just quote unquote bubbles because of like willy nilly fiscal policy by the Fed. No, 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 no. These are these are shockwaves in response to a lack of demand of labor in all sectors of the economy. What we're talking about with DLT and and all that blockchain technology bullshit, we're talking about eliminating cadres of fucking white and blue collar workers that are currently working office jobs and nobody's really considering like, you know, what, 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 what kind of shockwave is that going to send back to the global markets when people are having to liquidate all that fucking stock that they bought just to keep the lights on because that's what they're going to be doing you know you look at the rate of mergers and acquisitions going on out there and the size of the companies that are doing it right now they're trying to offset losses that they are experiencing due to the fucking loss of of the worker base that we've had in the united states i mean we're we're having a massive loss of labor But I, I expect a lot of it is, is going to continue to trend along, but more and more of it's going to be coming to cryptocurrencies because the regulatory burdens that are being placed on new businesses are, are just out of control. I mean, literally, you have to start a business as a criminal, as a criminal. You have to be operating outside of the taxation regime. I mean, as far as you can. You know, you'll like maybe rec- report your report your income as a private contractor for a, a fictitious business you started in Nevada or someplace where they they don't actually require a physical uh, thing beyond a uh, post office box to have a corporate location. <laughs> but that that's the reality that we're facing right now. Is the the economy is burgeoning with ideas. We want to go into space. We want to go into the skies. We want our fucking air cars. We do not want mass transit. We do not want to live in stacks of fucking mobile caves. That's not the future that that we see in the Jetsons. That's not the future that we see in Star Trek. The expectations that we're developing from those shows are beyond this, this idea of shuttling people back and forth at you know 300 400 miles an hour on a train or whatever that that just that's not enough it's not enough it's never going to be enough for the future that's ahead of us the future ahead of us is in the sky the future ahead of us is in space and and trying to live like we're on coal in in the 1950s is going to fucking kill us the places that are reaching beyond that and are trying to integrate renewables and are looking beyond the politics of the existing energy paradigm and, and trying to see where tomorrow is going to lead them, they are going to be ahead of us. You know, we're, you look at, look at China and you look at Germany, they're already marching down this path. They're already trying to break the chains of dependence on petrol and and coal and they're they're looking to wind power and they're looking to tidal power and they're looking to solar this is a growing trend and it is not going to end anytime soon i mean sure we're we're still going to need what we have of fossil fuels for the interim but that's only to continue to convey products to and fro once we get over the the naivete of the idea that we need to maintain the current paradigm with regard to liquid fuels that then we'll be able to move it forward into the future and i've already seen little glimpses of it you know there was a period of time during uh, bush's first 10 first 10 year first time around right before well between the time he got elected and 911 where gas prices were just shooting through the fucking roof. I mean, $4 and change a gallon, okay? And the market response 
at least where I am, was really interesting. People started going to McDonald's and saying, Hey, are you throwing away those 55-gallon drums full of cooking grease? If so, I would like to buy it off of you. And a, a unregulated black market for cooking oil began. And what they were doing is, they were making biodiesel out of this shit. And I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the free market at work. Okay, now, one of the problems with that period of time was that they didn't have cryptocurrencies. Now, imagine ICOs and a project like Hemp Car. Like, if, if you look that up, it, it's pretty extraordinary. Their fuel efficiency, I figured it out, was it was on par with, with uh, liquid diesel um, that we currently have, if not actually a little bit better. And the, effic the efficiency in the... Um, and the uh, quality of the burn was a lot better. But they literally traveled all over North America in this vehicle, fueling the vehicle on nothing but biofuel derived, or biodiesel derived from hemp oil. And uh, I, I've harped on that one a million times, but that one I see as an eventuality too. And we've already started breaking the reins with, with recreational. And... I'll be perfectly honest with you. That was the absolute worst possible way for us to get to where we are with regard to cannabis. They made us do it the worst possible way. They made us legalize it as a recreational drug to get it to here. I mean, it, it's... It's kind of beyond comprehension to me. But we are getting back to a point where cannabis will be a major textile crop in our future. We will be exporting a shit ton of cannabis in the future. And, and you, can, you can take that one to the bank. There have already been movements pushing towards this in in certain states and they haven't had the liberalization of of uh, medicinal even or or recreational cannabis yet and like I'm I'm speaking specifically of I think it's Kentucky um, they they had a thing where some some Indians grew a shit ton of hemp and the fucking DEA came in and torched all of it and and they were going to be making insulation with it and this is non psychoactive hemp industrial hemp it's like you know but below i think it's like 2.5 percent thc or some shit like that it's primarily male stocks but the point being that the the feds have had the the legal ambiguity of their their status or created by the, the differences between their status and the state status and they've used it to their advantage to allow for them to enforce their mandates on a state level. And the biggest, the biggest reason that's been possible is because there hasn't been a big enough economic driver, a big enough tax return, you know, from from people making money in the industry and showing what it's actually worth in the community, you know. And that has changed here in Oregon, and it's cre it's created a really a really big counterbalance to the prohibitionistas, and they still exist here in Oregon, and they still have quite a bit of strength here. But it is waning because counties where they they've been um, dry of um, of things like. Uh, recreational cannabis dispensaries, medicinal dispensaries, things like that. Um, they're starting to look at the counties that have allowed this and seeing all the additional revenue that it's generating for their cities and they're saying, well, you know, maybe the, maybe, you know, maybe the people of Oregon were right when the vast majority of voters actually voted f for this to be legal and maybe it'd be a good idea for us to get in on that action. And this effect will continue. 
We're seeing it in cryptocurrency with the investment in it by by legacy financiers like Goldman Sachs and Chase, uh, Chase Manhattan and all those guys. We're going to see the same thing in cannabis. And more and more, as it becomes a bigger financial interest in the individual states, it, it will motivate the federal government to further diverge from their current policies. I mean, right now they're still considering the possibility of rescheduling cannabis, which would solve so many fucking problems. But they haven't quite done it yet. And I, I think that the longer that they sit on that, the more this the individual states are going to chip away at the at the negatives of utili- utilizing cannabis as a medicine or a drug of recreation or, or or something to that effect. If you if you look at what's going on here in Oregon, shit, we're we're about to defelonize all major uh, all hard drugs. So like LSD, ketamine, all that shit. They're going to decriminalize it more or less, or defelonize it. And there, there are conditions, and you got to read into it. But it, it's slowly but surely we are going to get back to the point where we have a fucking apothecary. Only the apothecary is going to be carrying drugs that actually work, and not just fucking snake oil. Okay, there, there's going to be shit that's got fucking Airwood Vault trip reports and whatever thick as fleas all over it. It's going to be going back to the harm reduction model of like the Silk Road and other markets like that. And we're going to see a revolution with regard to neuroscience and the use of of drugs in in psychology and psychotherapy and whatnot. And I think that we're, we're going to be coming toward healing as more than than treating you know we're, we're going to be talking more about healing instead of just treating people and I, I think that's a healthier paradigm because otherwise you just depend you create another dependency you become a parasite much like the healthcare industry here in the United States parasitic is all fuck but it's only because it's been allowed to become that way you know, it, one another aspect of cryptocurrencies and, and quote unquote blockchains, it's very little, very m- mentioned very, very little is this. Out of all of the things that they do, blockchains have one attribute that makes them valuable, uh, more valuable than anything, is that they are able to produce as accurate as has ever been possible. A true accounting of the state of affairs with regard to funds that has ever been created. Now, when you when you consider things like the healthcare industry and what the effects of true accounting will be, all, all like you you, you can. Cut about 60-70% of the current medical industry out with quote-unquote blockchain technology. And this is assuming, of course, that they are legitimate blockchains. They are not, they are not mutable or editable or anything like that. And ideally, they would be mined by the public. Ideally. But this is just to maintain a continuity of the integrity of... And that's what we really bring to it. And again, that's really underplayed, especially by all these people that they they want to make everything fucking off-chain and bullshit with their fucking lightning networks and all that. <laughs> you know? Anyway. I, I've been wanting to touch back to some music for just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and do that at this moment. Because... I need something to drink. It's just got to happen. And you know what? The radio is is saying we should play some Push Monkey. And I, I think it's correct on this one. And so, uh, yeah, why not? Push Monkey Spider. Got to get down to it here. 
Push monkey, push monkey, push monkey. There we go. Spider by Push Monkey here on Coin Metal. And that was Nin with uh, Nine Inch Nails, that is, uh, with The Hand That Feeds. And uh, I want to throw down a, uh, a quick article here. It's quick enough. We've got enough time, just enough time to squeeze one more in. And I think this is a good one to round out the finality of it. And uh, just to let you guys know, you can always find me on uh, Telegram, also on IRC. Find me on Twitter and Facebook. Um, when you see my videos on uh, on YouTube, if you didn't catch the whole show, hey man, it's there for you. I upload them. Sans music until we get all that commercial bullshit sorted out. But at some time in the future, I intend to have it full run all three hours as you get it live. Anyway, so this is on uh, Inves Inves.com. Um, and this is by uh, Dimitar Bogdanov, Bogdanov, and uh, he has a picture, clearly has a penis. Bitcoin likely to be best performing asset through year end, Wall Street strategist says. Bitcoin will likely be the best performing asset through the rest of the year, according to Fundstrat's co-author, Tom Lee. In comments to CNBC earlier this week, Lee suggested that the digital currency was still an, quote, under-owned asset and, quote, good store of value. Quote, I think Bitcoin is an under-owned asset with potential for huge institutional sponsorship coming, Lee said on CNBC's program Fast Money. This is, I'm sure, of course, some sort of dependency on Segwit. Quote, it has a lot of characteristics that are very similar to gold that I think will make it ultimately attractive as an alternative currency. He added, quote, it's a good store of value. Last month, Lee became the first major Wall Street strategist to publish a report on Bitcoin. In that report, he proposed a model for establishing valuation framework for Bitcoin based on the premise that the cryptocurrency could become a substitute for gold. Based on this model, Lee forecasts that the Bitcoin price, quote, could be 20000 to 55000 by 2022. <clears throat> I think you're being modest, Lee. In his latest comments, the strategist also highlighted recent developments that seem to be paving the way for options trading on Bitcoin. Quote, institutions have to directly buy the coin today through a broker, but both the CBOE and the CFTC have opened up options futures trading. So I think that's going to grow in holdings, he said. Last month, Chicago Board Options Exchange, the largest U.S. options exchange, announced plans to offer Bitcoin futures by early 2017. Also in July, U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission granted digital currency trading platform LedgerX the first license to clear and settle derivative contracts on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin's steady performance has continued in today's trading with the digital currency's price surpassing 3550 for the first time. As of 214 BST, the coin was trading at 3535 on the Coinbase operated exchange GDAX. The Bitcoin price has risen just over 4% in the past 24 hours, according to GDAX data. <clears throat> yes, it probably has. Actually, it's probably another seven hundred dollars on top of that, and this is this is originally published on the eleventh. So yeah, three days, seven hundred dollars. Yeah, fuck you, Dem Demitar. Sorry. <laughs> no, not fuck you. Um, yeah. Again, zero acknowledgement, zero whatsoever acknowledgement in the the fucking factor that the printing of fiat currencies and their introduction out into the market by people who have been hodling it for a while now um 
what what effect that's actually having on the price of Bitcoin? Zero. None. I mean, it's like these people imagine that there's just like infinite monetary value out there, right? And and we're just like waving it into existence with that old magic wand. No, 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 no. There's a, there is a finite supply of these things, or at least of the good ones. There there are a few that that have infinite supply, and and one in particular that has infinite supply and some sort of actual continuing validity as a currency, and that's Doge. Surprisingly enough, Doge is still kicking along out there. And of course, they're they're a low cap like us here at Verge, so. Eh, whatever. I mean, there's always these these questions about when we're going to moon and all that other bullshit. You know what, dude? If that's your goal, maybe you need to find, like, another coin. I mean, the, the goals of Verge are not get rich quick on suckers. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I mean, there's there's plenty of that that goes on. There's There's manipulation that goes on out there. And I'm not going to deny that. I'm, I will deny that I had any part in it because, fuck, dude. If I had, I'd probably be, <laughs> I'd probably be rich. But I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm probably like the worst trader in the crypto sphere. <laughs> in all honesty, really. Um, <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, even as bad as I am, the kind of return that I've had in cryptocurrencies has been quite extraordinary, uh, with regard to. You know, by comparison to my return in uh, legacy markets, just so yeah, I um, I I don't have any confidence in derivatives trading against Bitcoin in in any kind of um, I don't know. In in honest terms, I think that. The likelihood is that they'll dilute, they'll dilute the value of Bitcoin. You know that that money that would be invested in Bitcoin would be otherwise invested. However, I don't know that that'll have very much effect on the price. I mean, because you won't be able to spend these things as money like you can with Bitcoin. And I I think that's. That's kind of a factor that these people are missing. They they look at, at Bitcoin as gold in the investment vehicle type type class. And it's just not the same. I mean, because for one, the individual can own it, hold it themselves right off the bat, have physical ownership of it out, without any third-party intermediary. And that makes it fundamentally different from gold in that you have at least a dozen brokers between the ground and your hand, assuming you ever touch it. And they're all getting a cut. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and close out this episode. And um, I'm going to do a really short final dance because it's like 10.59 according to my clock. And yeah, right to nothing. Right to Nothing, Lost Dance by Prong. I know I've pronged you to death today, but that's just the way we roll. Anyway, we will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And until then, I want you all to trade safe, do your homework, and watch out for your bunghole because nobody else is going to do, do it for you. Thank you very much for listening, and you all have an excellent day. <laughs>